Hey, it's Matt Pinto. Welcome to In a Lonely Place. Um, I'm very, very excited about our guest tonight because all I can say is I've been such a massive fan of his band since uh, the early 1990s. Big fan of everything he's done, really, for almost 30 years. The different projects and collectives he's been in, uh, all his own projects, and also all his incredible production. So I was thinking to myself, who would I love to have on the show? And the name that came to mind was Ken Andrews. So Ken, welcome to the show. Good to see you, man. How are you? Good to see you, Matt. Nice. You know, to see you're looking great. Yeah, thanks, Ken. You know, we're working on it. It's been a crazy couple of years after being hit by a car and surviving that, which was which was an incredible miracle. Uh, but you know, I'm very I got very positive. Uh, you know thoughts because you know i'm just i'm getting through and fighting through all the insanity with the covid and you know you and i both have families and and children and you know just uh the important thing is we're just we're just all out here uh staying strong for for our loved ones you know what i mean and, and doing absolutely what yeah and focusing on the things that we love the most which are music you know the things that are the most important to us so um and that it's been pretty crazy times right i mean how's the homeschooling thing going uh, with the kids, Ken, because I know that that, um, you know, my daughters are both older now. You know, what I mean, they're mm -hmm. uh, they're both, uh, you know, one's college age, one's in college, so she's doing homeschooling, you know, for college, and the other one is already, you know, out of college. But um, how is that going for you know uh, kids? You know, elementary school. Uh, it's uh, I'm taking it day by day. I mean, it's been changing a lot. We've been trying different methodologies, and uh, you know, I'm just. Ultimately, I'm thankful that um, my kids are both pretty tech savvy at this point. So um, they seem to be able to get around and get logged in and, um, you know, do their do their thing. But it, it hasn't been without some uh, issues for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I'm mostly technical, you know, just trying to get all those kids logged in at the same time. You know, it's it's a new world. Yeah. Excuse me. Woo. Bless you. All right. Thank you. You know, so Ken, you know, I want to kind of go back through your history because you've got so many fans who love uh, love failure and love different projects you've been in and I really admire your production. But mm -hmm. I want to talk about your history. So I know you were born in Seattle, Washington, and um, but how long did you live there? And I know you've been in the L.A. area for many a year, but what was your mm -hmm. childhood? like? Did you grow up? Uh, in your early years, those those formidable years, were they in the Seattle area? What was it like? Yeah, uh, I moved. I moved to Southern California, well, specifically to San Diego, when I was thirteen. Yeah, right in the middle of you know just really getting into rock albums um, as a kid. I was probably really into rock albums more like not starting around nine ten, yeah. and just was like you know just just a listener. And, you know, just really into it and, you know, uh, uh, avid, like I would listen to my favorite records like t way too many times. Um, but all of that kind of like, I think was just like, it was like data being entered into my my soul or my head yeah. or something. Yeah. <laughs> and when I finally was like one day, I was kind of like, you know, I, I want to try to play guitar. Um, I had all of that, you know, in there. So, yeah, I was thinking about those records and especially the records that had guitar that, you know, kind of made my ears prick up, you know, like, whoa, what's that? Like, how is that? How is that being done? Um, those are the records that really stuck with me. And what was that like? I mean, were you uh, were you in a radio in San Diego too? things like, you know, 91X and the other rock stations where you is that where you were discovering music as a kid? Yeah. Um, and also on the radio in Seattle before I moved. Um, and also just like, you know, the junior high I was in up in Seattle, a lot of the kids were into hard rock, Van Halen, ACDC and stuff like that. So um, I got, you know, I got interested in albums then and started finding things that were a little more, you know, off the path. Um, probably more when I moved to San Diego. Yeah. And that's when new wave was kind of becoming more, more dominant, at least on radio too. 
Yeah, I mean, it was an exciting time. I mean, it was it was time for a breath of fresh air. There's no question about it. Mm-hmm. Um, in that period of the late 1970s, because, you know, like in the around 77, you know, 76, 78, there was, you know, radio, mainstream radio around the country was playing, you know, the same five albums, like Book of Dreams, Steve Miller Band, Boston, Frampton Comes Alive, Fleetwood Mac Rumors, and Asia. And that was it. Like, I mean, in, in parts of the country. Yeah. But there were pockets, places like San Diego or LAR in Long Island or K-Rock that were, you know, embracing the new music that was out there, which was which was a really cool thing. Of course, mm-hmm. me, I was, you know, a high school kid and then there was college radio. So it was so exciting to be, you know, playing those new bands at that period of time. But how old were you when you actually picked up your first guitar and, and started learning how to play? Um, like 17 and a half. Like, yeah, right around um, winter, way back when. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, it was right before I graduated high school. That's amazing. Um, and my brother was already a really good guitar player. So, so I had an in there in terms of getting some free uh, instruction. Yeah. You know, so just And he, he sort of showed me some basics. Um, and then, you know, it's just like for me, I think I was one of those kids who just gravitated towards listening to records, stopping the record, putting the needle up, okay, and then putting it back down, you know, just kind of piecing together what what the puzzle pieces are for uh, rock music, basically. And that's great. So when, when you ended up coming up with a concept for failure, well, maybe I should wait a minute. Were there bands that you had previous to failure that you had started during those early years? Nothing, nothing that really did anything. There was a few efforts at um, playing covers in like barns and stuff like that in North County. Yeah. Uh, but not, not, like it never really ma- manifested into like a gigging band. Um, but um you know, one of one of the friends I met down there in that scene ended up being the first drummer in Failure. Yeah. Uh, we actually, I moved to L.A. first, and then he came up like a year or two later, and I was going to Cal State L.A., and he was going to LACC. And you were studying film as well, weren't you, at that period? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which, yep. which explains your film background. I mean, I know, like, you know, years later, you did some editing on, like, Prison Sex, the Tool video, and you know, worked on things, you know, stuck on new video, which was breathtaking. It was beautiful. Um, mm-hmm. You know, so you use those skills that you, uh, you know, went to school with. So, but you met the original drummer. Um, and then where did you meet Greg? Was that like uh, literally? Well, I, I was kind of chipping away at some, like, I thought they were really rough experimental demos. And and Robert, the, the first drummer, he, you know, he was like, yeah, that's kind of cool. And he made some suggestions and then he was like, you know, I think we should do a band. Let's let's look for a, a, at least a third, maybe a fourth member. I mean, I don't know if he wanted that for I can't remember. But um, I was like, OK, great. What, how do we do that? And it was like at that time, it was like the recycler and music connection. Yeah. Those that were the two ways to find people. Yes. Los Angeles. Yes. Yes. So but the thing of it was, is from the day that we first actually put an ad up to when Greg called, I think was like 14 or 15 months. Wow. I mean, it wasn't something where we were just like, this is, we got to make this happen. You know, this is like, this is, we, we did get a few calls maybe every month or two. But we could just tell them by the phone calls that it wasn't going to work out with pretty much everyone. Uh, the only person I think we felt like we had a chance to identify with was, was Greg. And we, so he, I believe he was the first person that we ever got in a room with. Yeah. And actually played together. Do you know what was in that ad? I mean, how did you describe yourself? Yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure, like, I I know The Cure was in there, and I'm pretty, Bauhaus might have been in there, too. Yeah. Um, And I think there was either a band that had fretless bass, or maybe we even just said Mick Karn, 
Yeah, who was great. It know. was awesome. And but this was like our, yeah, this was kind of like our, like, uh, intellectual kind of concept for, for the band uh, before Greg even joined was, yeah, let's do a, a rock trio, but with fretless bass, yeah. but really distorted guitar. Um, and so, and and we did that for the whole for, for the whole first album and the first you know maybe two years of the band, and then we kind of just abandoned that sound. I think by the time we were finished recording Comfort, we were kind of like, mm, are we really really executing? Are we? Is the part you're playing really have to be on fretless? And a lot of times the answer was no. Yeah, but but at the beginning it it sounded that way because you like. Obviously, Mick Karn, you know, Japan and those bands that were, uh, there's so much stuff going on then, right? I mean, there was, there was. And I think maybe it was that we, um, you know, we, we, we saturated ourselves with that maybe a little too much when we were, were listening to it. And, and so maybe we just kind of got, got a little bored of it. I'm not really sure. But the funny thing is, cut to, you know, whatever, 20 something years later, we were just literally the band, the same band, or just doing a jam. Well, sorry, we have a different drummer now, Kelly. Um, we're just doing some jam writing, and Greg walked in with the fretless bass, <laughs> <laughs> and it was awesome. It was so cool. He's playing it totally different now. Way, way more, more interesting. It's really, it was really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, but I think I think that's great. So tell me how the deal came down with Slash Records, because, you know, you guys were a different, you know, for me, when Comfort came out, I saw that I felt that Slash was, you know, taking different chances and going in different directions. I mean, I obviously love the label for the people like X and the Gun Club and so many other people they had had over the years. But when they signed the band, I was like, wow, this is really cool. And uh so tell me how that came down. Well, that that was Randy Kay, um, you know, coming to see the band, I think, at Al's Bar. Yeah. Which then was called something else for a while, and then I don't think it's a venue anymore. But um, it was either Al's, I don't remember. It was one of those really tiny bars that was really, that were booking local bands. Yeah. And you didn't have to pay to play. And it was they were dives, and it was awesome. Yeah, because the pay to play thing was so was just fuck criminal, typical bullshit. And uh, you know, finally, eventually, the area got called out on it. And but it was it was I mean, it was rampant at that period of time. But yeah, that, you know. But it's yeah. Cool. But oh, go ahead. I was going to no, say. Was, yeah, that I mean, it was there. There was a real division at the geographically at that time where. The Sunset Strip with the whiskey and the Roxy and whatever else was going up, the rainbow or I don't know. That whole scene was like very by the numbers and very like very corporate and sort of calculated. And at that point, the, the bands that were playing there were incredibly similar to each other. I mean, like it was very hard to tell some of them apart. It was it, it had become like a you know, like a uniform that you would wear if you were part of that scene. And for us, I think we really didn't like that. And we, we but, or we thought it was funny. So I think that's why we named the band Failure. And we even said it, I think we said the name in the ad for Greg. I can't even remember, but we, or may, no, maybe it was just our goal at the time. One of our goals was to actually play shows under the band named Failure and have those guys, the, the kind of hair metal strip guys, look at that and go, who the hell would call themselves Failure? <laughs> <laughs> that was like that was like yeah. our inspiration. Yeah. That, that is, was it. <laughs> that's great where that came from. I mean that's <laughs> yeah I can imagine what what I mean what a division of what was happening there. And you're right. And I think at that point too, you were on like the third and fourth tier hair metal band. So it was like, you know, the ones that had, you know. Yeah, they were so right. It was so ripe for being satirized and and messed with. And so you had this like, and it, it was a sort of nicer part of town, the, the West Hollywood. And then you had like the divey, you know, dirty part of Hollywood where 
you were having these much smaller shows, 150 people, and it looked packed, you know. But the the music that was actually going on was was cool. It was much more edgy, which was great for the time. Yeah. So you when you got signed and you you know you did your first record with Steve Albini and you did it in Pachyderm, right? Which is that place that's up in Minnesota, right? It's, it's yeah, uh, Cannon Falls, Minnesota. Yeah, which is like you know we were in Utero was done with Nirvana and of course. Soul Asylum did Grave Dancers Union there. There were there were quite a few records that were done there. Mm -hmm. um, after us, of course. Yeah, after you. <laughs> no, that was that was Steve's fine. He he's the one who knew about it. Yeah, I mean, it was all after, right? So it was all after. So like, let's, yeah. take, let's talk about that. So were you guys? He found that, and you were the first band to record there, right, with him? Yes, and I believe we. No, sorry, second band, and actually. The record that he had done, the one record that he had done at Packard for us, what was out, and it was a really cool record. And I'm based on the name of the band, name of the record, I think, was Sea Monsters. What was the name of the band? And I'm trying to remember. British who, band. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I'm trying to remember who that was. We uh, know that. They were cool. It was a cool record. And the really cool thing about that record is that you could really hear the ambience of that studio. Like yeah. Steve, Steve really likes to, to capture the room. And we were just like, yeah, that sounds great. You know, so when, yeah. when he brought the idea of, of, of recording there. I mean, how was the decision to work with him? You know, were you big black fans or did you just like, you know, were you, were you interested in some of the stuff that he was doing back in that period when Touch and Go and all that Chicago stuff was happening? Yeah, I was into that and I was into big black. But the funny thing was, is that the first time we talked on the phone, um, I was like, man, you've done a lot of different stuff and different kinds of stuff. I mean, all in the sort of indie rock or punk rock idiom, I guess, but like different styles. Um, I just want you to know, like, these are my favorite, pro like production wise, my two favorite records that you've done recently in the last four years. And that was Jesus Lizard Goat. Yeah. And Breeders Pod. Yeah. Which had, you know, that cover of Happiness is Warm Gun on it. Remember? Oh, which, yeah. That was a great I mean, cover. Yeah, it was that, cool. And the Jesus Lizard record is still, like, I, that record holds up. It is. Time. Mean, love that David Yow's out touring again and doing stuff. Yeah. You know? Yeah. He just, he's, they, I, I always love going to see those Jesus Lizard shows back in the day, which is cool. So what was, so it's your first record, right? So you're signed to Slash. Steve picks up uh, the idea of doing Pachyderm. You guys go out and it's it's a place that's kind of, it's out in the woods. But I mean, it, what, did you feel that was a great place for you to work? Cause it was kind of getting away even from home and from Los Angeles. Did it feel like it was a great work atmosphere and incubator for you guys to record? What was that feeling like when you got there? Um. I mean, it was our first time making a record, so everything seemed, you know, like shiny and new and crazy and like, so we're getting paid to do this, like this is crazy. So, but yeah, I mean, looking back, it's incredibly isolated. Like we never left, we not once. Um, so it was kind of, and the house itself, not the studio, it's like the studio uh, building and then the house building um, you know, it was very sort of like 60s, 70s, uh, McMansion-y sort of. It was weird. It was it had a weird vibe, but it had an inside uh, ground level pool that we loved and Steve loved it. And we swam in there like every night um, after recording. So it was cool. We got to know each other really well because that was it. It was like he, Steve had hired someone to come and actually like prepare, make meals for us and yeah. just leave them in the kitchen for us. So, it was so cool, right? It was somebody yeah. local that he, he found that was. It was someone that he, he, a friend of a friend, I think that was in a band that, you know, was also a chef of some kind. Um, and they lived some, for some reason, not too far away from where, where the studio was. Um, but it allowed us to spend the maximum amount of, amount of hour, waking hours actually recording. 
And creating, which is cool, yeah. Yeah. How long did it take you to finish Comfort? Um, I want to say, like, somewhere around 16, 18 days. Yeah. Not long. Not long. Like, and the, like for us, like, the amount of days was pre-calculated based on money and stuff. And it was, I didn't, I didn't like that. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted more, I wanted more time. Yeah. Cause that's the way you like to create, which is cool. So, all right. Well, you know, I mean, we should, let's now let's go to the second album. Let's talk about magnified because at this point you've always been a guy who's like to experiment with, you know, with equipment and production. And at this point you were producing the record yourselves when it came down to magnify when, when you did that. I mean, sort was, of, it, I mean, it ended that, that ended up being the case. What in the you end. start with some, someone else? Like was it, were there we four? did start with someone else who ended up quitting halfway through the recording of the record. And, yeah. and they over disagreements with me and Greg, basically, it was just, it was, it wasn't going well. I mean, we, in the pre-production part, it seemed pretty cool. And then once the recording started, we just had too many times where we were talking about sounds and different parts and what octaves to play certain things in. And he had a lot of opinions and most of them were not syncing with ours. So um, it ended up being just kind of like a, a disagreement that we couldn't um, overcome. And he bailed. And then the funny thing was, is I think there was like like two or three weeks where the label didn't know that the producer had quit and we didn't tell him. Right. So we just kept working and we were just waiting for, you know, to get cut off basically. Yeah. But then they came up to listen to some stuff and they really liked what they heard and they didn't really say anything about the producer. So we just finished it. And then we went and mixed it with David Bianco. Yeah. I did. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, who just passed away sort of recently. Um, Sorry to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, and that was another huge, like working with Albini was a big, um, excuse me, learning experience for me. Uh, yeah. First time working in a in a proper recording studio and, and watching someone of work who has a definite style um, was really cool. And then working with Bianco on the mixes for Magnified was also really cool because um, he was like a seasoned veteran and he would just dig in there and it was very fun communicating our thoughts to him and then hearing it come back. Yeah, so you felt good about that. Yeah, we feel good about that. Did you ever mention the other producer, or would you rather stay away from that? I'd rather stay away from that. Yeah, which I get, totally, you know what I mean? Because it's not been uh, documented. But, the, I mean, but the, it, it makes total sense, because you have always had your vision, Ken, too. And with you and Greg, you knew what you wanted. So, ultimately, it worked out that way. And the label was happy with the way that it came out, which was, which was great. When they yeah, I mean, that was actually kind of complicated. Because what really happened was... Greg and I had demoed the album Magnified in its entirety with four track cassette machines. Yeah. Quite detailed for it only being four tracks. Um, and when we presented those as like, here's our songs, our demos for the second album to Slash, they were very excited about them. In fact, Bob Biggs, the owner was like, why don't we just release this? Why do we have to do a different recording? These are awesome. And to us, we did like most of what of the recording, but to us, the drum machine stuff that mostly Greg had programmed was like just placeholder for a real drummer to play. We just couldn't, because we weren't trying, like the drum machine stuff that we were programming was not drum machine type parts. And we didn't, really see ourselves as an electronic band of any kind um we, we always envisioned the music to be played like a rock trio with a live drummer and have that feel and sound so to us it was kind of like yeah yeah i we like that the they connected to the creativity 
that we had put into like the guitar sounds and stuff like that, but we couldn't get our heads around the demo esque of or the demo ness of the um, of the drum machine. So we went ahead, recorded the whole album, turned it in, and we were like, "What do you think?" And Bob was like, "Meh, I like the demos better." <laughs> You know, like fifty thousand dollars later or something like that. Yeah. And he was just like, eh. And that was funny because that ended it that that meeting had an echo like, you know, maybe a year and a half later when we were done from the touring of Magnified, and we went to Bob and said, Listen, this time instead of even using any kind of producer, could we just like do the rec buy a bunch of like cool recording equipment and let us go make those four track demos that you liked, but we'll have 24 tracks this time. Yeah. And, and our manager was like, he's not going to go for it. And I was like, well, let's just try. You're probably right. And as soon as we set it, I was, I was like one minute into the pitch to Bob and he just was like, yep, all good. Send it, give him the money later. I'm going to lunch. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. So, no pun intended, but that was, you did some of it in Los Angeles, some in like Silver Lake, right? You did it yet was all over, right? Where you worked on that record? Where, Fantastic Planet? Yeah. No, we, we rented a house. It's a bizarre story. We, we rented Lita Ford's first house that she had bought in Tahunga. You know where Tahunga is? Yeah, I know where Tahunga is. Yeah. Yeah. It's like La Crescenta, that sort of area. Um, and so you want to just tell me how Kelly ended up joining them? Because Kelly is, I mean, like that, Kelly, that, that completed the band for me. Like, you know, I mean, look, I love all the early records too, but Kelly was like, just, he was so great with you guys. You know what I mean? Playing with you and playing with Greg and playing with Troy, you know, like I just loved uh, when he joined the band. You know what I mean? I, th I thought well, he t we went from being like a, an okay live unit to being a way better live act, I think, when Kelly joined the band. And the interesting thing about Kelly, because we're pretty hard on drummers in the studio yeah. when we're working with people, but the thing that was great or fortunate for Kelly is that he joined after the recording of Magnified, but for all the touring of Magnified, which was like, a, a hundred or two hundred shows, I think. So yeah. when we went to go record Fantastic Planet with him, we already had a really strong connection with him, like musician-wise. We had a shorthand. We didn't have to. It, it wasn't like a new guy joining the band. He'd already been in the band for like a year and a half. Played all these shows, tons of conversations about playing and parts, and you know, so it was that really helped. Yeah, it's amazing. So tell me about this house. We'll go back to it. So it's Lita Ford's house, first house she owned. Yeah. Right? Was this I, something she bought like in her runaways, like later runaways days or when she was? I think so. In the hair, like the, the, when she like with Kiss Me Deadly and, and the stuff she did during the like her 80s. I wonder. But um, I don't know exactly. But, but she, she, the strange thing was she left a lot of her personal things there. And that was weird to us because like, we weren't the first renters. Like there was another band in before us. You probably remember uh, Medicine, Brad Lehner's band. Of guys, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. how we found out about the house. And the reason they found out about the house is because they shared a business manager with Lita Ford. Yeah. And it was just <laughs> like, it was just bizarre. It's like it's like one of the first Airbnbs, right? We're like, yeah. We're all still there. That's well. What and for a band that was just getting into that new uh, tech, like ADAT and TASCAM digital 8-track technology, yeah. it was a real uh, boon in terms of like having more recording time with pretty close to the same quality of recording technology and gear. Yeah in a house that you're paying $2,000 a month in rent instead of $2,000 a day to be in an A list, or even a, at that time, like these studios were getting 1500, 1600. Yeah. And so it gave you the time to take your time uh, to create all those things and all those cool interludes and segs that are on the record. 
I mean, <clears throat> you know, I mean, you know, Ken, we've, you know, what I love is in, you know, and we're going to talk about that too, is the new box set that's coming out, which is fantastic. I mean, available digitally, I know on vinyl, which is incredible too, but you know, you went and remixed and remastered everything. Um, but the testimonials are something that I've been talking about for years. Whenever I've, I've been wanting to turn people on to, to the band and Fantastic Planet, uh, and I would say to people, this is one of my favorite albums of the 90s, maybe one of my favorite albums ever. Um, I love the record so much, but I would also explain to people how many other musicians and artists love the record with the same kind of passion that I had for it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so what I love about the liner notes in the booklet that's in this new collection that you have out from 92 to 96, Failure, is that you've got people in there talking about it. You've got, you know, obviously Maynard, James Keenan, the Tool guys, you've had a long, long-term relationship with those guys, friendship, touring, all of the other different things you've done together. He's always, we've he and I have had these conversations over dinner where we've talked about for hours about the band, about Failure. And he's in there, Chino, is in there from the Deftones and, you know, Sam from Interpol and all those different people. Uh, it's great. You've got some interesting testimonials from all the people that are in these liner notes as well. And then talking about the making of those records. So I think it's really great uh, that people get to see that. And that's not even everybody because, you know, and Dean DeLeo's in there, my old Jersey brother from STP. Is mm, in there. Yeah. But even the Pearl Jam guys, guys from all these different bands, I've, I've had these conversations. You know, Kim Thiel from Soundgarden talked about this. We talked about this record. Does it, did, it, was that one of those things where you still, uh, it's great to feel and know that how many other musicians that have really loved this record and have taken it to heart? Oh, uh, it's, yeah, it's an amazing uh, compliment. And it's, it's kind of hard to believe sometimes because some of the artists are like, I'm just like, wow, because I really respect almost all those artists in a huge way. So that part of it is just, yeah, it's just really, um, it's really affirming, especially when you are an act that, you know, really hasn't had huge commercial success. Um, it's, it's definitely a nice thing to have that sort of angle to it. Um, and it's also interesting because we're, uh, I, you know, nor normally band, a band's band, when I think of band's bands or whatever that people say, you know, use that term, a lot of them are like really more like um, proggy bands. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. You can play super fast and that's a whole other universe that we don't really participate in. So it's kind of interesting to be one of these like more fringy bands that's, you know, not super um, proggy at all. In fact, I don't even, yeah, I'm not, I'm not gonna even try to um, nail that one down. But um, yeah, it, 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 I feel like we've eked out a little little slice of something. Yeah. Not sure what it is, but it, it it's it's a cool feeling to have it recognized for sure. I know, it's it's incredible. How, were you excited when, um, when Maynard with, with a perfect circle decided to do uh, The Nurse Who Loved Me and from the album, even though I know that wasn't your song, but you were you guys excited? You're like, hey, this is this is great to see that. Uh, I mean, he's always been such a big fan of yours. Um, was that cool to have that covered? Um, yeah, it was amazing, especially when I heard the version. Because when somebody told me, oh, he covered it, I was like so curious. Like, was it going to be like similar or far away? And then, of course. The version on the album is very far away, so I really, I, I really respect and enjoy that version. Um, he did do, or Perfect Circle did do, a little bit, kind of more in between their version and our version when they played it live. Yes, which was also cool, and I joined them on stage for that a few times. So yeah, it was really fun. I mean, when you guys came back together for uh, that weekend for Maynard's birthday, fiftieth uh, birthday. And you know you guys in Perfect Circle and Pucifer, um, you know, that was a failure fans uh, dream come true because a lot of people didn't get to see you. I did, of course, but a lot of people that became fans afterward never saw the band the first time around. You know what I mean? And uh, I mean, it was ju it was a, just an incredible thing. It was very cool. And, you know, I want to also I know we're, and I want to remind people that are, that are watching us 
that this incredible box set is out. It's coming out, right? Is it out now? Is it available? It's out. And actually, to be truthful, I'm pretty sure that um, the vinyl is already sold out. It probably is because, yeah. by the way, when I was trying to look for some vinyl that I, you know, I saw the uh, Fantastic Planet vinyl on the wall for like $250 at Amoeba. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I'm like, wow. I go, I made, you know, before you guys reissued it. You know what I mean? Yeah, right. And I remember just looking at it going, you know, I really like that, but I may have to wait on that one for the price. But, you yeah, know. definitely wait. Yeah, <laughs> definitely wait. Amazing. But, um, you know, we also, you and I talked about, we were in touch, and I, you know, I remember when um, I loved the Replicants. Uh, oh, and, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, Replicants record was so cool. And, you know, you working with the guys in Tool and, and all of you getting together. And I remember I was telling you that I, I was talking to Gary Newman about uh, your cover of Our Friends Electric and how many yeah. said it was one of his favorites, if not his favorite cover of the record he was he thought it was the best because you know it's been done by a lot of people right so you know weezer covered it dead weather covered it i know courtney love said she wanted to cover it yeah he said to me oh it's the greatest song of all time without a chorus <laughs> like, yeah. Well, you know yeah. what I mean? so and your version is so powerful it's like you know i remember the first time i heard that song and it blew my mind like when i was in florida i was in, in you know in, in uh like clearwater florida and a radio station in between Molly Hatchet and Skinner and stuff, all of a sudden this song comes on and I go, what the fuck? This is the greatest thing ever. Yeah. And I couldn't stop thinking about it. And I got all the way back to New Jersey and went to the record store and found it, uh, the album Replicas. And That's right. it was very life-changing. So then I saw Gary live, Pleasure Principal tour. They called it the Touring Principal in 1980. And then a year later for Telecon, I went to see him twice. Yeah. Uh, and they were just so great. but. You know, I loved it. First of all, I, I knew you were a fan of his when I saw you named the band Replicants. Yeah, so of tell- course. Huge, <laughs> huge fan and huge influence on me personally. Uh, probably more than the other guys, two guys in failure. Yeah, I know, I know all of this, all of this way. Tell me about, like, so when did you discover him? Probably, uh, you know, same when I in on, on, I'm pretty sure 91X yeah. in San Diego, you know, in high school. Probably was like, you know, 16 or 16. 17 or something like that and it was probably cars you know but then you know most of my friends weren't really digging too deep on albums they were just you know into the radio but i i found all of his prior work and just got really i went i I went deep on that stuff so yeah when we ended up like just jamming together in a rehearsal space i had just listened to that song driving over and, and Paul Demore was in there and Greg was in there and I think Chris was in there and we were, what do you guys want to play? And I was like, I know what I want to play. <laughs> and that was, I think that was the first first song that little, you know, uh, group of people uh, actually played something. Yeah, which is amazing because that's supposedly, oddly enough, that's a story about the dead weather when they were trying to figure out what to play together. That, uh, that that's what they said, that they're like, oh, let's try our friend's electric. And then he's released it as a B-side of uh, Treat Me Like Your Mother, you know, which was, but it's one of those songs that's just so special. And it was so different at the time. And, you know, but I love it because it set a precedent for what you were doing with that covers album. And the versions on there were just so cool and, and different. I mean, that song in its own way was uh, a pretty true tribute to the original, right? But if you take something like Destination Unknown, that's like completely Whole different thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, which is which was great because it was like, wow, this is nothing like the original. This takes it in such a different, darker direction. Tell me about when we he- didn't. Yeah, we didn't have like any kind of overarching plan. You know, it, it, what had happened is. We had made a few of these demos in that rehearsal space I was just mentioning, the, f- the four of us, who were in different bands. So it, w- it, w- it was more of just fun. We were like bringing a couple six packs and just like, I think I had started to buy some of the equipment for failure that we ended up using at Lita's house later for Fantastic Planet. But this was a rehearsal space, so it wasn't, it was, kind of down and dirty and we went in there 
and we're just having fun. And I was like pra practicing recording. Ended up, I remember Paul saying, I want a cassette of what we did tonight. And I was like, okay, I, I'll drop by tomorrow. And somehow that cassette ended up in Matt Marshall's hands, who was uh, Tools the, and our guy. Right. Yeah. Matt, a good guy. Matt's, Matt's yeah. a friend of mine, too. And yeah, I mean, he worked at Zoo, you know what I mean? And uh, then RCA, and now he's over at Concord. But it's, um, yeah, that's great that he decided to put that record out because I love that you guys decided to do it. So, you know, paying tribute to a lot of great records from that era that we're talking about, even doing the cars, just what I needed, which was another one of those life changing songs. I remember the first time I heard it when it was brand new and I went, what the fuck is this? And I was, yeah. in, and obviously right away, in my, it was like, like our friends electric. It was, it, it, you know, just what I needed being the first single from the cars debut album was just blew me, blew my mind. The first time I heard it, I remember exactly where I was driving as a teenager in the car when it came on the radio. Like, I, you know, it's one of those things you have to- You'll never forget it, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So so cool. But like to do a song, like Silly Love Songs with Maynard, right? You guys do that um, with Maynard from Tool. And it's kind of one of those songs that a lot of people have thought was always one of the, you know, I mean, obviously Paul McCartney's Paul McCartney and he's done so many great things, but Silly Love Songs is considered one of his, you know, more light, lightweight songs, right? Um, but you guys, again, took that in a different direction. How did that come up? Like, let's do this McCartney song, which was actually from like 76, 77. I'll tell you how it happened. It happened that, you know, Matt said, stay in the house and make the replicants record. Here's some money. And so, and he said, um, you know, Maynard's going to sing on a track or two. And I was like, oh, okay, cool, awesome. And so sure enough, like maybe, I don't know, a month later, Maynard was up at the house. But before he before he came up, he called me and he's like, so what am I gonna do? And I was like, well, here's some songs that we're thinking about trying to do something with. And Silly Love Songs was on that list. And when I, I remember I said that name and he just, like snickered on the phone he was like <laughs> yeah he's like i'm like what he's like i have an idea for that one <laughs> well, he, probably, you know, he probably was thinking i'd rather do jet but you know but i'll do but if i'm gonna do something like silly love song right no i i just think he he's always looking for the you know contrarian path yeah. he in pretty that. much everything right so yeah. like he, he was like silly love songs i know that song let's just go let like, you know, more than the opposite. It was like a complete retake on it. And we slowed it way down. And um, um, that's the one that it, it's almost hard to recognize the connection to the original. I yeah. Think, record. It's amazing when you think about that. You know, it's uh, and then in, in that way, I guess we, when he did the uh, third Perfect Circle album, Emotive, because I went up to his house in Jerome, Arizona and did like all the, the interview visual and audio for the rest of the world for when he did the whole covers album and almost takes the concept of what you did with silly love song and, and does an entire album with a cool version way you did imagine and you know you know billy howard l singing freedom of choice and different things that were on that record it was very very cool very but cool. you know let's and let's get back to failure i mean well you know we've talked about all these i mean i look at your productions the things you've done you know with, with nine inch nails even pete yorn and uh black rebel motorcycle club there's you know there's just so many different people that you've worked with i've loved a lot of your production i always wanted to ask you because you were involved in the production of the chris cornell casino royale uh you know my name mm -hmm. right which is a great track and you know obviously we miss chris so much you know but i want to know how that came about you ended up working on that uh track um i'm friends with leah volick at sony who yeah. like oversees music in the films over there. Sony Pictures. And Sony Pictures, yeah. And um, I guess Chris had already written a song and recorded it in England, I think. Yeah. And um, he wasn't happy with his vocal performance. Yeah. And he just wanted to, another shot at it, but he didn't want to fly all the way back to, to England. So... Uh, you know, Leah called me up and was just like, hey, I need some help. Um, can you redo a, a vocal for this 
James Bond song. And I was like, well, who's singing it? And she was like, Chris Cornell. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'm a huge fan. And I think it was that same day. I think it was like two hours later, Chris is pulling up to my house. And uh, yeah, he, he knocked it out in like an hour or so, of just kind of taking a couple of passes at it, talking about it a little bit. And he kind of wanted to just lay back the timing a little bit. Yeah. I felt it was a little too on top. Uh, but uh, his, uh, man, his, his microphone technique really, really freaked me out. Tell he me about he he, well, he brought his own mic, which is like an SM7, the DJ right. mic, right? A yeah. lot of people, a lot of people are into that mic, but like, it's kind of one of those mics that you don't need to use a whole lot of microphone technique on, right? Because it's meant to be, you're meant to be close. On here. You're meant to be right on it. It's yeah, that's, a, that's the design of it. So I'm, I'm watching the meters and dialing in his, you know, compression level or whatever. And it's all looks good, sounds good. And then he goes really loud. And I'm like, usually I will ride the microphone preamp with really powerful singers. I'll write it down so it doesn't clip when I'm recording, right? So you kind of just, it, it, if you're recording someone for the first time or the first time on a song, usually have your hand on the mic pregame just in case they go somewhere you didn't expect volume wise. Yeah. And I already knew the song because I had heard it. So I knew it was going to go loud and I'm waiting for the le level to change. He does, he does go down. I'm waiting for the level to change. The level doesn't really change. I look over, he's got the mic like on the floor, like by his feet. And he's just like yelling in this vocal booth. Yeah. He was like the he's the loudest singer I've ever heard. I mean, his power was crazy. Um, and his and he just was working that mic the whole time. And it you don't hear it though in the final, which is the point, right? Yeah. Um, like you don't hear the movement. You feel it's all even and right. It's all even. Yeah. He's like mixing it for you, basically. Which is amazing. Like yeah. on the floor in the book. Yeah, he was just like holding it way down here. It's just like, yeah. <laughs> that's incredible yeah i was just i was what <laughs> <laughs> that's great i'd never seen someone do that at, in a recording studio i mean he was truly one of the greatest singers of our generation right i mean or any i mean what, a, what an incredible guy right i mean yeah and you enjoyed super working sweet with too yeah that's great you know and talk about working with pete yorn because you know you did the, did you do the whole day i forgot album and stuff on the first record too right or, no no my so, i mean my 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 Let's see. I think that the only thing I have on the first album is for Nancy. That song. Yeah, Strange Condition, the remake. Remake, I think you did. No, I think maybe I did that. A, di yeah. a different version of that song. Yeah. I think, I, and, th and then on the is day I forgot was the second record, right? Yeah. And I think I did like three or four songs on that. Yeah. Um, and one of the singles, and then there was also a another song and i can't remember if it's on that record or if it was separate that was on uh spider-man soundtrack yeah i love that crystal village song that was great on there i think you did that but um i want to say but we're talking about working with nine inch nails too and trent because you guys both being have an incredible i mean you you're, you're you're both have real visions when when it comes to writing and recording what was that experience like with you and nine inch nails um Super cool. I mean, it was it was one of those things where um, his normal guy was not available that he wanted to use. And so he was just kind of pulling the band members. And I happened to at, at that point in the band, I happened to be friends with like two or three of the band members. So yeah, I think separate separately, he heard my name maybe two times. He was like, well, who's this guy? So I came down. He showed it was this was just for a live performance yeah he, he wanted a but a, he wanted a really slamming mix of his rehearsal essentially but they were it wasn't really a rehearsal they were ready to do a show yeah. um and they were had all their sounds dialed in and you know it was you know i'd often as a fan and also a musician i'd often wondered exactly how they were doing everything live who was playing what 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 
machines were they using? So for, for me, it was an amazing educational experience to see how Trent was laying it all out and, and you know, to really dig into those multi-tracks. It was really fun. Yeah, that's a, that must have been a good time, though. And uh, so, but, I mean, in Black Rebel Motorcycle Club, you know, you were working with them. Who were some, yeah. of, who were some of your, if you, when you look at some of the productions you've done, because you've done so many people have used you over years, what are some of your favorites what are, that you worked on? Uh, um, you know, some, <laughs> it's funny. I, there's a couple records. I don't know if I would call this record my favorite, but there's a record. I'm going to have to send it to you. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Did you ever hear of this band called The Emergency? Yeah, I have heard of them, of course. Yeah. Okay. Because, well, may, there, I, don't, I don't know if you've heard of this one. There's, there might be more than one, but there was one that existed for like maybe even less than a year. It, it got John Rubley signed it to Atlantic. Yeah. And I got the nod to produce and mix it. And this is one of my favorite records that I've ever worked on. And it never came out. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's so, yeah. It was like, it was partly, I don't know the whole story, to be honest. I think there was some friction with, within the band. The singer was a bit of a madman. So I don't know. Uh, but his... It was like, I felt like it was one of those moments where I was capturing when I was recording them. Yeah. Because I recorded them as a band. They played together and the singer like sang live. Yeah. And he he was performing. And it was one of those moments where it's like, I, I'm really capturing like something magical here. Um, so I was, I was really bummed that that didn't come out. I, I should probably just like, find that album and leak it on the internet or something. Yeah, you definitely should <laughs> hear it, you know? Um, and by the way, uh, thanks for coming up on what I want to, you've come up with a lot of things I love, but one of my favorite album titles is In the Future. Your oh, yeah. will be the furthest thing from your mind. Yeah. And, you know, there's always been, you know, like there's, you know, interestingly futuristic and, you know, sci-fi and space rock. There's been all, all you know, those elements in so many things. Tell me about that title. That is 100% Greg Edwards. Oh, it I is? Mean, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, completely. Um, great. Yeah, no, he t and he also titled The Hardest Monster Hardest as well. Monsters. Yeah. Um, you know, he's, he's, he's into titles. Um, you know, as the, as, as the history of the band has evolved from the very beginning, from comfort to, to now we're working on hopefully what will become our, our sixth album, yeah. Greg has gone from writing none of the lyrics to a majority of the lyrics. Wow. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's just something that has progressed for, for, for him. It's just like one of those things where it's like, yeah, I can write, we can both write lyrics, but if somebody's got really some really great ideas and some great lyrics, why compete with that? You know, yeah. it's like embrace it and, and get into it. So, I mean, the, the collaboration that we have in the music part is also, you know, kind of echoed in the, in the lyric part of it, where it's like, if somebody's got the, the vision for it, go. Like, like right now, for instance, we're working on a song where I really, I really, I demoed it up. I like my vocal melody and I like, a few of the lyrics, but the rest of it I don't like, and I'm waiting for him to rewrite them. Really, so. like, yeah. Um, so, and you know, I'm I'm thinking to myself, but you've always been a great lyricist too. So I I never realized how that was trans that transition was happening. But you and Greg were both writing from the you know if you go back to Comfort, you guys almost had an even amount of songwriting credit though on that record. Well, we've always um, just kind of split things. Because I think we've just kind of felt like, well, yeah, sure. Someone brings in one song and the other person brings in a different song. But rather than, you know, having to hash, hash it out every time, let's just split it. And that way we don't have to worry about it and or even, you know, have any discussions about it. And it's actually I think that decision 
has kind of served us pretty well. It certainly has. I mean, it's 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 one of the because there's enough to argue about in the studio, <laughs> you know, when you're when you've got two people that have you know strong creative ideas about things. Yeah. It's like let's let's keep it to those creative yeah. choices. Absolutely, I think it's great. Now, can I? You know, I ask you to do what we do always do on the show. And only place and it's pick seven of your favorite albums or albums that have been very inspirational to you. And these the albums that you picked were all in those years, you know, where they would be so, you know, just impactful and a blueprint. Uh, you know, uh, from eighty to eighty four is all the records that you picked. And uh, the first one that you picked, I'd like to talk about right now, is David Bowie's Scary Monsters. Yeah, you know that record's incredible. The title track and Ashes to Ashes Fashion. It's no game, part one and two. Yeah. Uh, why you love that record and, and what's special about it to you? Uh, well, I, I I was a fan of Bowie before that, but when that record came out, he kind of like to me was really opening the door on a more kind of noisier, experimental side of his, you know, his songwriting or his yeah. or his studio approach. And especially the guitars and the guitar parts that were happening on that record really had an impact on me because they were so like lots of space. Sometimes there wouldn't be any plane, and then just like a really weird slash of dissonance and and the sounds that the guitarists were using, which I think were um, Alomar and, and Fripp, right? Yeah, they were. Yeah, yeah. Those were the two I think main guitarists on that record. And they were also just kind of peaking as studio musicians. Yeah, and, I mean, and they were—you could just tell, like the it, from the guitar and the overall aesthetic of that record, they were trying stuff. Yeah, they, they were, weren't. They weren't. Uh, they weren't being satisfied with just like making a good, good rap, a good album. They were going for something kind of new and. Uh, and kind of edgy. You know, they were. And what's interesting, that was a period for Fripp uh, that was pretty interesting because he had done his Exposure album where um, he had had Daryl Hall come in and sing on a track that he had only listened to one time called You Burn Me Up, I'm a Cigarette. And he basically told him, just do it. I'm going to play for you once, then I want you to record right afterwards and sing it. And that was this Fripp experimentation he did with Daryl Hall but you know what Fripp told me about recording fashion is that they were like, you know, they were basically staying there at the studio where they were recording and he was sleeping like in a bunk. And that David woke him up and said, now nah, I want you to come in and play and just play whatever. Like he had not really ever heard the, the back track at that point. He okay. was waiting. And so Fripp literally went in there and played that. And all the other crazy stuff that we played on fashion, that was just a first take, which is a great story, you know. Yeah, and, and they probably he was, he was probably like, okay, let me do that again, and they yeah. were probably like, no, <laughs> like that was awesome, it's perfect, yeah. yeah, which yeah. is such a great one, you know. And you got you have that in common, you know. It's uh, I remember sitting with Bowie and Trent Reznor and talking to him, and him and Trent telling me the story about how the. <laughs> how he discovered Bowie, which is so funny in front of Bowie saying that uh, he had gotten Scary Monsters through the Columbia RCA Record Club. Oh, yeah. Forgot to sign the thing that you send back in when you don't want the record. <laughs> <laughs> and it just came. You went, oh, shit, I, I guess I got to buy this one. Oh, wow. And he listened to Scary Monsters, Trent, and then became a huge Bowie fan and was very influential. But that's funny, isn't it? But yeah, what that's a great right, record. All yeah. Right, yeah. So the next record you picked is another great one, man. And I, God, do I love those first three albums by these guys. And you could see them growing at a very fast pace. And it was the police who were such an incredible trio. And you picked Zenyatta Mandata, also from 1980. I mean, the first album was made in 78, Outlandis de Moor, and Regatta de Blanc in 79. And this record, um, it's amazing because they tell the story about how originally they weren't happy uh, with the mix, it was rushed so fast. So they went, oh, oh wait a minute. And um, 
I love, there's something great about driven to tears into when the world is running down and you make the best of what's still around. That tell me edit, what, that tape edit, you can hear it. Yeah, you can hear it actually, but yeah. tell, me, you know, tell me why you love that record. Um, I just thought there's an, you know, I was a fan of the first the records before that, but I, I think they really hit their stride there. Uh, there's a re- sort of a relaxed feeling to some of the stuff and they're like, they're settling into their sound. Yeah. Um, and that song in particular, which was, I don't know if it was a single or one of the real hits from the record, but when the world is running down, I always just loved the mood of that song because it was so subdued in a way. Yeah. It wasn't so like hit you over the head catchy. It was more more of like a, a mood piece in a way. Yeah, and radio played it back then. You remember? But, they yeah. did play it. They did play it some, yeah. Um, so I don't know. That song just made a big impact on me. I ended up doing a cover of it um, uh, on one of my solo records, actually. Which is very cool. And what a great song to do. And they were so good live, even from the very beginning. I, I, ne- I never got to see them live. I'm so bummed. Well, you know, like, maybe you never know. Maybe, I mean, you know, Sting is the one who always tries to not do it, but, you know, you never know. It could, who knows? Maybe they'll do it again one day. But I can say the first time I saw them, it was for $2 at the <laughs> Wall Street Theater in Philadelphia. And yeah. I tell this story because it's in my book, too. But I tell uh-huh. the story about how. The guy at the Ticketron, which is became Ticketmaster, where you go to like a record store or a luncheonette to buy, you know, concert tickets, <laughs> said to me and my friend, he goes, oh, this band of police. Yeah, you better enjoy them now because they're going nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that amazing? And even so he sold for two bucks and they did Can't Stand Losing You Twice because they didn't have enough songs. You yeah, know? I've heard a recording of that tour. And um, it's great, you know? Yeah. It sounds like they played some really small, really tight places. Yeah. And it was just, yeah. it was such an amazing, amazing thing. That weekend I saw, the next night it was Joe Jackson looked sharp. And Saturday night was fr- police Thursday, Joe Jackson sa- Friday, and Saturday at the Princeton gym, Elvis Costello and the attractions this year's model. What a fucking weekend. In wow. 78, you know, and I'm a, kid, you know, a teenage kid. It was incredible. So, uh, amazing. Yeah, just amazing time. Speaking of great records from back then, the third one that you picked um, is a great album from Susie and the Banshees from uh, 1981, yeah. Juju. And I loved that one-two punch. I mean, it, of course, there were two albums before it, but I loved Kaleidoscope and Juju. Those records were incredible. Christine was the first song that I heard from Kaleidoscope and just fell in love with it. Like, what is this? And then Juju took it to a whole new level with Spellbound, Arabian Nights, and monitor and that stuff. Talk to me about uh, your love for that record. That was happening around the same time as I was discovering The Cure, and and yeah, they, ultimately Robert Smith actually played with Susie, I think, for an album or something or a tour. Um, so there was a, a sort of shared vibe there. But to, I got the chance to see Susie around that time live a couple times. So that record and seeing her live and hearing that band live was just so, made a big, big impact on me. Because I never, for me, it was a, a sort of a turning point where I was like getting into those kind of like, you know, I don't know what you want to call it, gothy type sound. But it was more than just the goth at, or dark aspect of it. It was like, they were actually doing some really advanced musical shit. I mean, like some of their um, chord, chord voicings and and rhythms, like Budgie on what he he would do with drums in that band was like really uh, advanced and kind of forward thinking for a, for a you know a, a, on the surface just just a rock band. Um, so hearing that level of like like thought and 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 innovation in, in her in that album specifically really uh, had a huge impact on me yeah i, I love that and i uh, mean you can listen to some of my guitar stuff on comfort and draw a straight line to that record yeah i mean john Mico, she was so, such a great uh player yeah but drummer everybody you know that band 
And now the Cure, obviously, they had their thing that they did together as well, and they were always so close, and it made total sense. And it's interesting you picked uh, two different Cure albums, which I love the fact that they're not, uh, you know, some of the most popular albums, but at the same time, when pornography came out after the first uh, three, after, you know, you know, after Three Imaginary Boys, which in this country was called Boys Don't Cry, it was a domestic release, and then and then you had, you know, obviously 17 Seconds, which was the first time I saw The Cure live. I saw them do that. And then the third album, Faith, pornography had taken them in a totally even dark and darker direction. You know, I mean, with A Strange Day and 100 Years, all those, all those songs on there. Tell me why you love that record and how that affected you. Well, that record is just so um, dramatic and so dark and so extreme in the kind of emotional content and mood of it that it really just kind of hit me over the head. But then it has this other level of like really kind of um, extreme, extremely interesting craft going on in the production of that record. Um, That record is almost all the drums are actually drum machine, but they sort of have this feeling of being played or it sort of sounds like a drummer in a studio. And part of the reason for that is, at least on a number of the songs, they, it was a drum machine, but they were piped the individual outputs of the drum machine into like whatever PA speakers and, and, and guitar amps they could find and put those in the live room um, and then mic'd and recorded that. They didn't record the direct outputs of the drum machine, which was a pretty interesting kind of thing. And it really, yeah. you it, can hear it. In the you can hear it. Yeah, in the yeah. Hang Garden, it's so weird. You definitely feels like, you know, you listen to songs like that, right? Like hang Garden and you're like, whoa. Uh, it just sounds like, it's like some guys, that get, you know, like, a, it could have been recorded outside. I mean, there's something, it's, you know. It sounds out. very, it sounds organic, but it's actually a machine. And there's a kind of aggression and, and kind of violence to some of those drum parts that just really, I, had, I hadn't heard that technique before. And combined with the kind of crazy voicings that he was using on, on guitar, um, it was just a very, very kind of new sound to me. Um, I was familiar with their other records, but when that record, when I heard that record, I was like, wow, it's so striking. And again, that's probably one of the most influential records on my guitar playing for sure. Yeah. So good. It really is. And then you picked, you know, like after pornography, they took this three single break, which, you know, people, uh, that didn't know that they were coming out in the order they were. And I interviewed them when The Walk came out, the second in that series of singles. But it went, Let's Go to Bed, The Walk, and The Love Cats. And that became, you know, Japanese Whispers as, a, as an album collection. And that was like, you know, like they'd gone so far with pornography that they decided to do things that were like a little more like in mainstream. More in, singles. In more yeah. singles, not so much mainstream. But then the top came out with Caterpillar and, and different things on there, Shake Dog Shake. Uh, and you love this record, The Top, too. Again, another record, um, you know, from 84, right? And it was, uh, you know, looking at that, it's, you know, Give Me It was one of your favorite songs on this record. It's just so, you know, again, it's similar in a way to pornography, but it has a little bit more depth to it in terms of the different kinds of songs. Some songs aren't so dark. There's a there's a there's a lightness to some of the songs and there's a kind of whimsical thing that's not really in pornography but there's a there's an overall just like identity to that record that is not shared with any of his other records i don't think there's a sound to it um it has there's a lot of middle eastern instruments he's using in there and again it's just like this record where it's he just created this like universe and it's unique. Like there's nothing really around it. You go into it and you can kind of live there. Oh, you absolutely can. It's, it's, it, it's got, again, I love their experimenting with sounds and the different things that they created in that period of time. Never afraid to make a move 
ever. And his vocal too, like you could, he's just getting really um, um, confident with his um, sort of like blue notes that aren't really in the key of the song, but they're so expressive. Like he's just really, just he's on it, you know, as a composer and a singer, I think during that period. Although it's very, very dark. So I I don't know really what was going on in his life, but. Yeah, I think he's really great. I think he's a great creator of story because he's uh, he's been able to maintain this. I mean, look at their amazing amount of their their catalog and work, all of the massive amount. And they're working on that new record right now, which is pretty amazing. So Uh, let's talk about Rush moving pictures. Um, Yeah. And cameras. I mean, look, it's interesting. Somebody just released because they're doing a tribute uh, to Neil Peart of, you know, Modern Drummer Magazine put this thing together with a ton of drummers. It's a pay-per-view live event. And, um, you know, obviously, uh, you know, some of those records I saw are great. And I saw Rush for a Farewell to Kings tour. But, you know, my favorite album was Fly By Night because it was the first one that I really discovered. And it was Neil Peart's first record. And I saw a listing recently that listed the album that you picked as their number one album of all time. Mm-hmm. And Pick 2112 as number two, which was that concept album, which was literally their fourth record. And Fly By Night, they listed as number three, which I was very high, uh, you know, happy about the placing uh, of that. But Moving Pictures inspired so many people and love that record. And one of the songs that you love on that is Camera Eye. The camera yeah. Eye. Talk to me about that. Well, I mean, I like the whole record. I mean, I, so yeah. much has been written, and I mean, we've all heard the, the, the big hits on that record so many times they're just yeah. like a part of culture um but that song in particular i think really uh gripped me because of the arrangement um you, you've got this sort of and the the way they build tension yeah um you know i i have I, i've had a kind of strange somewhat ambivalent relationship with like prog type music in my whole my whole musician life basically like my brother was that's where this comes from basically he was a huge rush fan and he was quite a good guitar player and could actually play along with almost all of their songs like alex lifeson he had to yeah i mean and so alex lifeson for me is bitten like he's always he's just there he's just in my head because i've just heard his playing so much and that record and that song in particular i don't know there's just there's a chain in them like maybe two-thirds of the way in that song where they come back to the um sort of main motif but they change the key yeah and it just it's just an incredible moment it's just i don't know it's just hit hit, every time i it never gets old for me I, yeah. Every time that part comes, I'm always just like, I yeah. wish I would have written that. I mean, oh my God. I know. So it's great. I mean, you know, they made some incredible records and that was a very sad loss we had this, this past year. Oh yeah. Yeah. When we lost Neil. Um, and the last record that you picked of the seven that were very influential on, I know there's, you know, it's such a hard thing for me to ask artists. Um, you know, seven records is like, I know that's just scratching the surface, but it's a great one that you picked because it happens to me. You know, it's my favorite Cocteau Twins album. It's uh, mm-hmm. the album Treasure. Love that record. The 4AD band. And, um, you know, I always loved the first time I remember I heard that song, Evo, which, I mean, some people might think it's called Ivo because Ivo is the guy involved in their record label, 4AD. But it's she's singing Evo to me when I hear that song. And I right. love the atmosphere in that record. Something. That record is just <laughs> dripping in beauty and and depth and emotion it's so that record is so powerful for, really? for being a record that is you know like sonically kind of light you know i mean i wouldn't say light but like it's not a hard rock experience at all but right the the power of the emotion is so heavy and so um i don't know profound yeah, it sounds like Lorelei too, right? Which is oh, so cool. yeah, that's that's the one for me where I was just like, wow. I mean, Robin Guthrie's, um, you know, guitar sounds in that era yeah. of Cocteau Twins. He was yeah. just going off. 
I know. And Elizabeth Frazier, her voice, the way it's layered in that record, too, is so beautiful for me. Well, that's the thing about a lot of their records, but especially that record, the layering of almost all the instruments is yeah. just... I'd never heard that before. I think he took the studio and the layering of like different, um, slightly different guitar tones, but layered it in them on top of each other. He kind of took that to a whole new place. Yeah. So, um, you know, like ambient guitar sounds. He really did. And then, you know, when I was talking about the song Evo, when it, when it gets towards the end and there's the instrumental break, it sounds oh, like yeah. you're going through a rainstorm. You know what I yeah. mean? It literally does. You're listening yeah. you're, and you're going, wow. I mean, you're just in the center of sound. It's yeah. a beautiful thing, right? Such a beautiful, such a beautiful record. Yeah. It's one it. of those, to me, kind of perfect records. It is. You know? It's it, just, it just works top to bottom. Yeah. It's, it is a great one. And for people watching us, they should definitely check that record out. It's, it's one of my favorites. I love that. It's always, it's one of those things that I've always had to replace. <laughs> you know what I mean? I had a vinyl originally on 4AD and then an older CD. And then I bought it when it was finally reissued in America. I had to read. Somebody took mine. I think I lent it to someone. As you do, you know, you lend your friend something. You got to check this out. And then you don't see it again. But hey, you always find a way back to it. Ken, you know, I want to thank you for taking the time today. You know, I mean, I really enjoyed having you on, man. It's always great catching up with you. Do you Likewise, remember? Matt. Really, really good to hang with you. <laughs> you know, and you know, it's yeah. funny. Ken, I think you were my, when I moved to L.A. the first time in 2000, uh -huh. my first phone call. I remember when I. I remember that. Yeah. You know, I was like, Ken, hey, man, I moved to L.A. And I, I, I gave you a call because uh, it was just, uh, I was excited that I was going to be on the same coast with you. I'd moved here to do the Farm Club show. And uh, I was living at the Oakwoods. And uh, yeah, no, yes, I remember. But That's uh, right reaching out to you that first night when I landed. And I think I had just moved to Studio City at the time. Yeah. 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 So you were nearby. Yeah, that was, yeah, the Oakwoods. Isn't wow. it? You know, yeah. quite the history. Besides, oh, yeah. <laughs> besides, besides being on Jay Leno where they would like knock on people's apartment doors all those years and then, you know, all the, all the child stars, the kids that would come to audition for all the you know, there's a big documentary. It's about the Oakwoods that came out a few years ago. No, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Wow. And I remember. I'll have to check that. It's a funny story. I was when Maynard was mixing a perfect circle of uh, Meredith Noms, he picked me up and we went to dinner and then he brought me to the studio while they were mixing like some tracks and then he dropped me off at the Oakwoods. And when Maynard and I pulled up in front of my building there, there were a whole bunch of coyotes in front of it. Oh, wow. Maynard, oh, a pack. Yeah, it was a pack. And Maynard goes, you want to stay in the car for a little bit? I'm like, yeah, yeah I guess we'll hang out. <laughs> so we <laughs> had Maynard's car. <laughs> you know, it was just, we thought it was the safest thing. You know, I mean, generally, they, they're they pretty cool with humans, but you never know. So Yeah, yeah. especially if they're in a pack, yeah. In a pack, yeah. You, you, it's a little bit to worry about. Ken, thanks so much for doing this today, man. It was great. Uh, and we look forward to the next failure record. I think it'll be great. You know, awesome. do you think there'll be a reprint of, or, or is that going to be a one-time run of 92 to 96? Uh, the vinyl. I'm not, it's something we're discussing. Yeah. yeah. I think there's, I think there there might be, the the two things we're weighing are, do the box set again, or, or should we make those uh, individual albums Available separately with the new re with the new mixes, right? It's yeah, really cool as well. I yeah. do love that, you know. And now we can change around some of the uh, packaging or booklets or you know inner sleeve, do some different things. It was just so long and hard to get this box set done during the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, I knew there were some manufacturing issues originally, right? Oh yeah, because yeah, I, I mean uh, we had delivered it essentially in February, mid February. Yeah. And so right when all of that was hitting and all the businesses were shutting down and it was so hard to get anyone on the phone and it was just, you know, we were, we couldn't really foresee that. That was, that, that was a tough one. Yeah, it was crazy. Well, I'm glad it finally got out. It's finally shipping now and people seem to be pretty happy with it. So, yeah. Well, Ken, it's great to talk to you, man. I'm glad your, your children are doing great. And uh, say hello to Kelly and Greg and everybody for me and, 
you know? Uh, but it was so awesome to do this with you today, man. Wasn't it awesome. cool? Yeah, totally enjoyed it. Yeah. Very, very cool. Thank you, Matt. It was great, Ken. Thanks so much for doing it. I appreciate it. Cool. And we'll see you soon. Okay. We'll let you know, of course, when those individual records come out, if they do or get, gets reprinted. And we'll be talking to Ken again when uh, the next failure record comes out. This has been In a Lonely Place. I'm Matt Pinfield. I want to thank Ken Andrews. And I will be back with you soon. Thanks so much for watching.